Hi and welcome to SCW, the wrestling channel here on YouTube.com. Thank you for choosing the channel and choosing the video. Please subscribe right now. Leave any comments in the comment section. Please like and share the video as well. It's time to have your say. It's the Q&A. That's right. Ask SCW is back once again, answering your questions in the wrestling community. Taken from Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can even drop a comment here on YouTube. Leave the hashtag AskSCW and I'll make sure to answer your question in the next video. All options of where to follow me should become on your screen right about now don't forget to check out wrestling customs as well on social media as well check out their website they're doing custom made championships for wwe aew and many many more and they've even got doing custom made ones now of some requests going i've seen this week as well including progress wrestling belts were made and all of them look fantastic go and check their website out now but without further ado let's get straight into the q a this week and we've got our first question coming up right now from dan the man williams that's right mr dwe with our first question this week and he asks, what do you think will happen to Hell in a Cell with it being so close to the draft? Do they have time to build up rivalries for the show? Such a great question to kick off this week. Of course, as we said, the WWE draft is coming up this Friday, the first night on SmackDown, and then the following Monday on Raw. This week on Raw in particular, you really felt like they were just killing time trying to get uh, to the draft. They didn't really want to do too much building Hell in a Cell. SmackDown on the contrary, kind of did sign kind of the opposite. We have Roman Reigns and Jey Uso announced once again for the Hell in a Cell pay per view. So that match is confirmed. What I would say with Raw as well is we look set for Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton one more time. I guess WWE had to make some choices and said these are safe choices that are not going to be moving shows. Uh, obviously, your champions, perhaps they you expect them to stay put unless they're going to swap brands. And Roman Reigns will have the Red Universal Championship again. We'll have to wait and see. I don't think that will happen. Reigns for me stays on SmackDown. Drew McIntyre. Raw has been built around him for like the last 9-10 months so to move him to Smackdown at this point uh, as he's still WWE Champion would seem a bit foolish it feels they are almost like the cornerstones they're what the show is built around so they will stay put um, I feel now it's safe Randy Orton and Jey Uso will be staying put on their respective shows as well building into this Hell in a Cell pay-per-view um, Bailey and Sasha Banks as well looks to be a match that's been leaked as going to be the main event of Hell in a Cell but uh, of course we were seen on this week's Smackdown that they've going to a match next week on Smackdown for the draft add some spice there but we'll talk about them two more in the next question one more match that I think looks to be kind of look it could be set for a build is going to start on Raw this week we've got a six-man tag announced uh, I believe it's Drew McIntyre with the Street Profits going to be taking on Randy Orton Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode now of course Robert Roode returned last week was against uh, Drew McIntyre you put them in this week with the tag team champions we can start building the Street Profits against Dolph Ziggler and Robert Roode going into the next pay-per-view as then they can try and hopefully with the with the draft actually freshen up those Raw and tag divisions but for the rest of the card um, I agree with you I think that it's going to be some very last minute decisions um, we have matches that seemingly are in place but it's what WWE decides to do with the superstars will we see super superstars in rivalries at both chain shows will they be separated will they still be able to finish off their rivalries they have so those chapters are closed if they're on new shows it's all still a bit up in the air and i do think that we when we look at this draft um it is a little bit in an it's not the most convenient time i think that if you were going to do it uh, i think it should have been raw this week and smackdown but they wanted obviously to do the first show on smackdown Maybe then they should have done the first night of the draft this past week on SmackDown, uh, and then we could have had the second one on Raw, and we'd have had then a two and a half to three week build for this pay per view. It sort of feels like smack bang in the middle, like you say, it's interrupted, it seems to interfere. But there are matches that look to be in place, and I think that we're safe with those ones. So those ones I can see going forward with the rest of the card. It could be last minute, but hey, it's a WWE pay per view. I mean, we usually get the last three or four matches in the card, sometimes even uh, on the last week after the the shows have been there's so many multiple times i've done prediction videos and then you get to the day or two before and another two matches are announced so um it doesn't surprise me it's very wwe in 2020 and uh we'll have to wait and see as and how things go towards hell in a cell but um so far as i've said a couple of times already i think a few matches seem to be in place um I, i'm definitely confident on two or three of them let's see what happens with the draft and we can take it from there Next set of questions come from Anub and Cohen. I mentioned Bailey and Sasha Banks. Um, do you think the WWE has rushed the Sasha and Bailey storyline, obviously referring to their match 
going to be on SmackDown next week. Uh, which male or female superstars that The Fiend will attack next? Very interesting question. Uh, and do you think NXT superstars will get involved in the draft in some form? Well, let's kick off then with Bailey and Sasha Banks. Now, obviously, that match being put on SmackDown was certainly a bit of a question mark. We've had about, what, a year's build for this, and we get told, right, you're going to be on SmackDown next week. It's not even a pay-per-view. We, I almost feel that this is WrestleMania worthy in your top three matches. I don't think it's quite on main event level as of yet. I think that they could progress the storyline more to have made it a main event level match. Um, I think it's certainly a pay-per-view main event level. Um, at, at this point, I would love to have seen it Hell in a Cell because I think that that's what they were building towards and that's what I thought. The question is now, as I said in the last question with the draft, is this match being done now because one of them is actually moving shows? Is Sasha going to Raw? Or what I would feel would be more likely, is Bailey going to be the one to go to Raw? Because you could see Bailey and Oscar in a feud once again, uh, maybe going forward for the Raw Women's Championship. Bailey, who's been in the SmackDown Women's Championship picture now for, well, nearly the best part of 18, 19 months with her two reigns, you maybe think that it would feel a bit stale with her being in the SmackDown Championship picture after the program with Sasha is finished. So um, there's lots of question marks there of, of how and why. I would say of putting it on, on a free TV main event, I certainly thought it's a bit rushed. I guess WWE wants as high of rating numbers possible for this draft. Um, they seem to be putting a lot of eggs in this basket. We've got the Falls Count Anywhere match, which I'm really happy about, by the way. Uh, I said this a couple of weeks ago, the term I felt that that was the next stipulation match I wanted to see now. Brought now we're in the Amway Center, which uh, we've now got with Biggie and Sheamus. We've got Kevin Owens as well against The Fiend, which will touch us nicely on to The Fiend now. Um, I mean, that seems to be the person he's attacked next. I think with The Fiend, you look and say, which show is he going to be on in the next couple of weeks? And that's really the telltale with, with a lot of the questions this week. It's hard to know what direction we're going to go with The Fiend. Interesting enough, though, I would say that I feel that he's almost turned heel, if you want, again, because it felt like he was turning babyface uh, once Roman Reigns returned and he was going to be the top babyface on SmackDown. This certainly was a heel move attacking Kevin Owens on SmackDown this past week. And uh, there has been a couple of reports going around that potentially The Fiend and Alexa could be two of the people going to Raw. Interestingly enough as well, The Fiend um, had, of course, the... the what was it, the walrus? I can't remember now the first name of the walrus. I've, I've tried to forget it, honestly. Um, but <laughs> you look at the walrus thing that came in the Fly Fly Funhouse, and um, I was really negative towards it, I must admit, and I know that there was quite a bit of negativity there. I wonder if the feud with The Fiend and Roman Reigns has been dropped, because it's been a number of weeks now that we've not had any sort of payoff or any sort of mention of The Fiend wanting to go for that championship again. We did have that little tease with Alexa Bliss last week, which made me think that's definitely the direction after Hell and, uh, after Clash of Champions, sorry, uh, going into Hell in a Cell. But it seems now we've got Jey Uso again in that championship slot. So um, there's certainly more questions than answers at this point of what's going to go on with The Fiend. And um, it's hard really to give you a good answer. And that's really not good because it's not the purpose of what these Q&As are about. But Kevin Owens seems to be the immediate direction. If they end up on the same show, I see this being more than one match. I can see Kevin Owens being someone that's beaten down on the show, managing to get the pay-per-view match, wanting to get revenge. Um, and I hope KO makes a move for SmackDown. I really think he could do with a trade. So if The Fiend stays put, um, KO versus The Fiend would be certainly something I would be interested in seeing. Um, to give an alternative answer, just to give some alternative for you, uh, I would go with Nikki Cross just purely because of the fact that uh, maybe Alexa Bliss wants Nikki Cross still as her friend and wants her to see things the way she sees things. That could be an interesting twist of that storyline because Alexa and Nikki, that's not finished in my opinion. I think there's still more to that storyline, but again, we're going to have to wait and see what happens after the draft. Speaking of the draft, we've got NXT TakeOver this evening as well, and that is going to shape a lot of what could happen. I do expect NXT to take part in this draft. I think that they politely could be taking away two or three of their top stars. I think that uh, is something that definitely can happen. I'm going to stick my neck out and say Rhea Ripley will be one of them. I think Rhea Ripley is moving to either Raw or SmackDown. And I think she's going to go to the show where Bailey is. And um, I, I think I can see that as a, a clean, fresh match that we could see. I could see, potentially, if Bailey was to move to Raw, you could see Oscar, uh, Bailey, Rhea Ripley, when Charlotte Flair returns, uh, you know, that's that's your top four immediately. That that really screams star power on that one side of the brand. Um, and I do think that um, when we spoke about Zelina Vega last week, uh, ironically she had her rematch on Raw. She was lost clean again. 
I have a feeling she's going to SmackDown. So I think that they are going to really move and shake a few people around here. Um, and I think it's going to be an interesting division afterwards, looking at the the, the women's division. But um, as for more NXT stars that you could look into, the Undisputed Era, I think, is a big question mark. I mean, this really is the, the make or break for them. Uh, if they go up to Raw SmackDown, they stay together. Um, if they don't, they split up. It's what I think the direction will be. And uh, I think we'll have a, a clear indication after the takeover this evening. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll have a good idea, of course, after the draft, what happened with them as well. But yeah, I do expect NXT to be involved. As for NXT gaining superstars, I think, well, they're going to gain one this evening on TakeOver, which we'll talk in the next question. Um, but also, as well as looking at that, I do think that they are going to get a few of the Raw and SmackDown superstars that are not getting enough TV time. I would not be surprised to see a couple of people that you think maybe are lost in the shuffle end up on NXT, or maybe people that are getting TV time but not breaking through. Uh, one superstar I would love to see that happen to, that I don't, don't think it necessarily will, but would love to see someone like Ricochet level to go back to NXT, I think would be awesome. I think that would really benefit and elevate the brand of NXT against uh, you know, AEW on a Wednesday. I wouldn't be surprised if WWE goes down that sort of avenue. If they don't see on pushing someone, uh, I think that they could end up on NXT. And someone is a very quiet prediction. I don't think this is necessarily going to happen either, but someone I think would make a great difference to NXT's TV ratings and certainly match qualities as well if he is going to come back to WWE TV in the near future would be Daniel Bryan. I think Daniel Bryan to move down to NXT to take on the likes of Gagano, Ciampa, Bala, you know, those sort of matches. And then Adam Cole, again, you know, as we've said before, Kyle O'Reilly, there's so many great dream matches. And Daniel Bryan loves a 30, 60-minute classic. He would be have the opportunity on takeovers and those sort of things to have those sort of matches. And Daniel Bryan, if he's not going to be the WWE Championship pitcher, yes, he can be in the mid-card championship pitcher. But I think he would be someone that would really elevate NXT. So I think NXT will be involved in the draft. It's going to be depending on what movers and shakers we get. And uh, I do think they'll lose a couple of the top stars, but they may gain one or two of top stars as well in the same breath. Next question is coming from Mike, Italian Habs Mike, asking if we get Roman Reigns versus The Rock at WrestleMania 37, how would you book the feud between now and then? And uh, also asking what surprises or swerves do you see happening at TakeOver? Well, we've been just touching on NXT, so let's just finish off on NXT then uh, all together, shall we? Um, we've actually spoken on Twitter, uh, and if you've seen my predictions video, I think the big surprise or swerve, obviously, we have this NXT mystery superstar coming in. I've predicted it to be Ember Moon. Uh, I have seen a report going around, potentially Bo Dallas could be that superstar. I feel that's very underwhelming. I don't think it fits the character. We've had a male and female voice. Who's to say it's one person? Maybe it could be two. That's a question mark and would be definitely a potential swerve because a load of people predicting one superstar to get two would be fascinating. But we will tell with that and we'll find out with that this evening. Uh, and if you haven't seen it already, go and check out my NXT TakeOver predictions, by the way. Uh, all the matches and all the predictions given for the show. Uh, but so just to sum up very quickly, I did touch on the Kyle Riley and Finn Balor match and I didn't really make much note of the Undisputed Era. Now, of course, there could be a case that the UB could implode this evening. There could be a case of where they could accidentally cost Kyle Riley the match or try and help him or any sense of the word. But I've not gone for that. And the pure reason I've gone for that is, again, to do with the WWE draft. I think if any plans are to break up the UE or do something with the UE, I think it's going to be on hold because the last thing Triple H wants and rumours say Triple H is not involved with the proceedings for the draft is to make this big call on the UE on Sunday and then they all get caught up and they're together the following week on Raw and SmackDown. Now, let's not forget, I think it was about a year or two years ago now, and Johnny Gagano and Tommaso Ciampa were about to restart their rivalry, and they were called up to Raw to tag team his DIY. It was so messy. I think Triple H is going to hold off on a big movement uh, tonight. I could be very wrong with that, but I think that if they're going to do something, I expect a big blowout on something like the Wednesday or the Wednesday after. I want... I think I would like them to see the draft pass first and then they can start building the blocks of what they're going to do with the UE going forward, providing they've not been called up to Raw or SmackDown. But just to finish things off on TakeOver, I think that this is a transitional show. I don't think it's the most exciting TakeOver I've ever seen, but it's a case of trying to build new stars, building for the next set of big TakeOvers and trying to make these new big names. We've had people that have been at the top in the past. It's time to start pushing the likes of Kyle O'Reilly as a single superstar, even if he doesn't win. Kushida, it's time for him to get his big moment. You know, We've got the Cruiserweight Championship on there as well with Escobar and Swerve. I think that there's great opportunities for people on this show to make a real name for themselves. And let's not forget Io Shirai at taking on Candice LeRae, which I think is going to be a mega match. Will we get the Mr. and Mrs. Gagano's as champions? Time will tell. It should be 
very exciting. As for fantasy booking time with Roman Reigns and The Rock. Now, I love the idea of it. It's definitely been spoken about a lot in the wrestling community over the last couple of weeks, and it could come very well together. And it could be a reason why Jey Uso is back in the championship picture again, because a lot of people would say, well, that was done so perfect to Clash of Champions that maybe there's no need to revisit it. We could move on to other chapters and Roman can continue on. But Roman said something very clear here that we're going to have some, you know, some consequences for this, for Jay to have another championship match, something that is going to be a big stipulation and something that's going to be bigger than we've ever seen before. Now, what is that stipulation going to be? I mean, that's the thing. They've, they've built such a high bar for this that there is a chance that perhaps it could be a bit of a letdown. So I've had a think about what they could do and perhaps maybe they could link this in together of how they're going to build Roman Reigns as this tribal chief going forward. Of course, he's got the new look now where he's not wearing the 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 vest anymore uh, and they've kind of got that similar tattoo of what the rock has and i think it could be built sort of kind of around this that he is the chief of the family the head of the table and his way of actually booking this match is that the usos are going to have to perhaps be against their will are going to have to admit he's not just the tribal chief but also um almost become become part of a roman stable going forward but instead of being how a lot of people would have perhaps fancy booked it before being where the usos would eventually be on Roman's side. It could almost be like the throwbacks of how we've seen, say, with the Bella Twins about six or seven years ago, where it's against their will. They don't want to do Roman's bidding, but they kind of have to under full sun, under contract, that they don't become SmackDown or WWE superstars anymore. They become Roman's superstars. The contracts are almost dealt with Paul Heyman, uh, and they're literally, literally told what to do by Roman Reigns going forward. And he's basically doing it as well in his eyes because he loves them and that he can see that they're going off in this weird wrong direction and they wanted to challenge him where really he's just trying to give them that main event spotlight he's trying to give them a good payday he's trying to help their families but of course the chief is the head of the table and why are these guys challenging we need to ensure these guys aren't challenging roman anymore and the way to do that is to have them against their will doing Roman's bidding and after that he'll come off so much more as a heel by telling them to do things they don't want to do and he can be just that guy of, well I don't I'm a badass but I don't need to compete I'll compete at the pay-per-view you'd constantly see it back in the noughties you know with that heel stable where it was every single week you'd have that heel champion and the the face superstar that wanted to face them you know at the pay-per-view but they had to work their way through the stable each and every week to get there I think Edge had you know the likes of Chavo Guerrero when he was you know with Vicky Guerrero you had JBL with his you know uh, group where he had the Bashams and had Orlando Jordan back in 2004. You had this kind of way where they did that to, to build their way to the champion. And also could be the ones that do Roman's dirty work going forward. So I think that that could be an interesting twist of how you build it. And it then comes to the point where, you know, The Rock, if you can bring him in around Royal Rumble time or however, you can start building it because of the fact that, you know, he says you're the tribal chief and no, The Rock is the guy that paved the way for you guys and he's coming back to take it. It would be fun as well to actually bring a legend in like Rikishi or someone like that to really try and, you know, try and talk some sense into Roman Reigns of why he's done this with the Usos, you know, his, his children. Uh, and you can see that, you know, they almost have to turn on Rikishi. It's just those horrible hill ideas that you have to have and then when the rocks had enough by seeing this sort of stuff he comes in and he puts the challenge out for Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 37 uh, and we have this big match between the two and it's, if the rock has that schedule free it would be awesome and now with the rumors this week as well WrestleMania 37 probably not going to be in LA it's probably going to be in Tampa or well, the rock is from the Florida area if he can keep his schedule free, I think that uh, this match can definitely be on. And you've got those building blocks to start putting it together. You can have almost the one-upsmanship, if you want, of The Rock trying to find ways to get Roman Reigns to not be that tribal chief. But of course, it will come to WrestleMania. And more than likely, you would see Reigns going over over these two. But um, certainly, there could be a lot of twists and turns of the way they could do this. I think definitely, if nothing else, it comes around the tribal chief. Uh, definitely that sort of gimmick, that sort of name. Uh, it's going to come stemming around that so it's gonna be interesting to see how it's gonna be put together if it'll be put together but um, certainly that would be uh, one fantasy booking idea that i would suggest could be quite fun uh, but i'll be interested to know your thoughts of it in the comments below next question is coming from austin whitley with alexa joining the fiend should she change her ring gear Great question this one. I really love the direction of what they're doing with Alexa Bliss on Smackdown. She's become almost one of the most compelling characters on a weekly basis now. Um, I love the fact that you know they're not actually making her sister Abigail which I think is what a lot of people the start wanted to happen i was really anti that idea but what they've done is they've kind of just brainwashed her and she's compelled she's cleansed and she's got rid of all the lies that are around her and now she's just happy to do what the fiend wants her to do and she seems like you say 
brainwashed and compelled. She delivers messages on his behalf. I think it's just a unique and interesting twist of what the Alexa Bliss character is and how she's been able to change her facials and you know her attitude and stuff and how these little little things happen with it's just being the music or whatever it is and hearing his name and she just changes and she always morphs into a female fiend and i think it's a very compelling storyline and i think as this goes we're getting in small steps and layers which i think is even more fascinating rather than just the quick turn and everything has changed and transformed in one go we're getting things step by step on a weekly basis and i think a change of ring gear is definitely a good idea why not because it would be a further layer to what we're getting in this character development of this new Alexa Bliss. We're already sort of starting to see it. The hair has changed um, a couple of times during this period as well, depending on what's been going on without this storyline. And like I say, a change of attire may be suitable as well, maybe something that would be Fiend-esque. I mean, I wouldn't want to see a mask or a face paint or anything along that sort of lines, but certainly with uh, the ring attire side of things, I certainly would be interested in seeing it and seeing where they can go forward with it. I mean, it's definitely a captivating storyline, and um, as I said, I think last week on this, I can't wait to see where it goes next. It's certainly, right now, I'd say it's possibly, along with Roman Reigns and Jey Uso, it's probably my favourite storyline in WWE right now, and I think there's a couple of reasons why. I mean, one, I don't think it's so predictable where it's going to go next, which I think is always fascinating from that standpoint, but two, it's just, it's taking a character that you've got on the roster, and turn and saying that there wasn't really anything wrong with Alexa Bliss on smackdown but the fact is with her and the fiend now putting these characters together they've got an interesting dynamic an interesting relationship and it's certainly fascinating tv to watch and i think that um had those been both characters continue on doing their own thing uh, it certainly would have been less interesting to see what they're doing now so for that i believe that applause needs to be given to wwe i think they've done great work when it comes to this storyline but um no i like your suggestion i think a change of ring gear could just be the extra layer or that next layer of what they could do within the storyline next question coming from a good friend of mr 1925 in kayfabe if retribution are a vigilante group they don't obey the rules and are happy to destroy wwe then why did they sign wwe contracts and agree to be exclusive to raw obeying draft rules and conversely why did wwe sign a group that openly declare they hate wwe and are there to cause chaos and supposedly ruin the company yet the very atmosphere of wwe is one to control where performers aren't allowed to do or say anything that goes against company policy hashtag kayfabe problems uh yeah there's a lot of plot holes in this i've kind of really butchered that retribution um with everything that's been going on with that over the last week uh, and i will continue to do so here now you've given me a great opportunity um but um the thing is with this yeah nothing makes any sense here whatsoever um I, it's hard to really give an explanation of, of why this makes sense now i do believe t-bar made some form of explanation that it was cheaper for wwe to sign them rather than WWE keep destroying their security guards was was the reasoning for it and retribution don't want wwe's money they're gonna pay it to their lower people uh, that they have their little minions doing the work for them you know not outside of the top five superstars that they have amongst their ranks but um for me i just feel that this is very flat it has a lot of plot holes in it it destroys everything that's going on uh, it feels to me that they wanted to do something but unfortunately have not been able to pull off the storyline the way they want to so now that they've started something it caused a lot of headway they've kind of had to tweak it and find ways to do with it but um when it comes down to the superstar names to come with everything it's all very lackluster it all just doesn't add up and doesn't make sense and uh one thing i will say for retribution though is that of course they came in contact with someone that had covid so they were not on raw this past week which i think may have done them a favor they won't be on raw this week coming up either they're likely to be on the uh draft raw which could be funny they could be drafted politely to smackdown which would make even more uh kayfabe problems they just i oh, would we'll just go to smackdown then uh but um i think they're safely going to be sticking around on raw but i think the couple of weeks may just take a little bit of the steam off of what's going on because a lot of people really had strong opinions were laughing it was even backstage stuff of rumor that it was laughter of superstars just feeling horrible for these guys that they've had to go through and do this angle um and we'll have to wait and see how it will play out but i'm sure most of us kind of feel that it's probably not going to end well for them so um 
yeah, I mean, when you look at this, it doesn't really add up. It's It makes no sense. Even T-Bar, bless him, trying to make some sense of it. None of that stuff adds up either. So, yeah, it's not looking good for Retribution at this point. But um, the superstars themselves, they are talented. I hope that they get the opportunities to showcase what they can do. I hope that in some way WWE can turn this back around. But it feels very difficult to do so at this point. Next question comes from Dylan Ketchum, and uh, he was thinking, do you think Wardlow could join in a circle and leave MJF? What an interesting twist that would be. I love it. I think it's a great idea. Uh, certainly something I wouldn't think or would see coming, but um, certainly there's been a lot of teams of MJF and Chris Jericho, and um, it seems to be at the moment, if you're looking at it from this week, that maybe MJF is trying to get in the inner circle at Sammy Guevara's expense, and maybe Wardlow would join them as well. Um, but you would see dissension amongst the ranks if MJF was to join the Inner Circle. Maybe he would be someone that would take over the Inner Circle, getting rid of Chris Jericho. Maybe that is the, the long-term goal, and maybe it would be him, Wardlow, Santana Ortiz, and Jake Hager. I'm not quite sure it's ever going to go down that sort of avenue, but um, I think Wardlow would be very interesting because if Chris Jericho was able to get him away, let's not forget after all out, there was dissension between Wardlow and MJF, and of course Wardlow wanted to leave MJF, but MJF is the one that employs him, not AEW, so if Chris Jericho was to be able to get him out of the contract, give him a better opportunity in the inner circle, fascinating, I think it would be great, and I really want a Chris Jericho MJF match, I think that would be awesome, I think for that to work though MJF has to remain the heel, I think Chris Jericho can still be that whiny heel, but he sort of almost has to become more of the babyface of the two, it would almost be like Steve Austin and Kurt Angle back in 2001 when they were trying to get Vincent Mann's appreciation and how they can bounce off each other in that heel kind of way, uh, but still being comical at the same time, and still getting both of themselves over uh, I think that that would be absolutely fascinating it's certainly something I want to see but as for your suggestion Wardlow it would be definitely something out of left field it certainly would be very clever booking and uh, it would be something that I would be in favour of but um, do I see it happening? I don't see it happening. I don't see either of them joining in in the circle. I can see MJF Wardlow at the moment creating their own stable going forward against the inner circle. Tie at World Order with our last question this week. And uh, Victory Road, which is tonight, or was actually last night now at the time of me recording, uh, was confident we'd see a title change leading into Bound for Glory. We came very close in one of the two of the matches. Uh, Impact seems to be moving the belts though around these days. It's becoming too much. Are you okay with the respective title scene at the moment? And the bonus question for me as well is what happened to the Call cool Your Shot trophy? Well, let's start with the Call cool Your Shot trophy, shall we? Now, I can be wrong, but I feel like it may have been used for what was going to be the April pay-per-view of what got Michael Elgin and Eddie Edwards the match with Tessa Blanchard at the time, which in the end, of course, was scrapped. Uh, and then it feels like everything was kind of dropped from there, which led to Eddie Edwards going into the anniversary match. But um, I can be wrong. I mean, this year has felt a very long year, and I I've tried to do a bit of research trying to find stuff with the Call Your Shot trophy and was a little bit unsuccessful of trying to find stuff with that. But um, I, I just kind of feel to myself that... Um, it can be something that may have just been kind of politely forgotten about when we had the perspective with lockdown and stuff because a number of talents were missing from Impact Wrestling for a little while. Eddie Edwards, I believe, was one of them. Tessa Blanchard, of course, was missing for a long time. So you kind of look at and say that maybe it was quietly dropped. Uh, they know that Eddie Edwards was in the championship scene anyway. He didn't need to call his shot and he was going to win the championship. But um, yeah, I mean... I will forgive them on this one, but at the same time, I do think that when the storyline starts, it should have a conclusive finish regardless. But um, this year has been certainly a uh, exceptional circumstance of a year, and uh, I kind of am a bit more willing to let a few things slide in wrestling companies than perhaps maybe I would call out on other times. I would call my shot usually, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm going to let it go on this occasion. But um, as for the championships, yeah, we were very close last night. and Some great championship matches that I really enjoyed Eddie Edwards, uh, you know, in a losing effort in the end to Eric Young. I, I did enjoy uh, the match as well with Diana Prazo and Susie. Rohit Raju was definitely the one that was the closest to losing his belt. And uh, I mean, I, I felt that that was booked perfectly and sort of almost as expected. It's really building for that Bound for Glory match. It certainly feels like it will be a multi-man match for, for him there. And uh, I, I reckon, obviously, we're looking with uh, Willie Mack there, TJP, Chris Bay, Trey Miguel. Uh, I'm hoping Ultimate X comes in for that. But um, that is definitely, uh, when we go into well, your question there with the championship belts that seems to be changing hands a lot, um, that one is changing massively around a lot. Uh, when you look to the other championships, I mean, the North were tag team champions for like a full year. So to have the one change there, 
Um, we could get another change of bound for glory, but I wouldn't be so problematic with that, really, because it's quite a bit of a gap between Slammiversary and Bound for Glory. It's certainly at least three or four months anyway, which I think is usually about a good time for a champion to hold their championship. I mean, unless uh, they're in a long-term storyline that's really working out really well or they just really are that over as champions. Sometimes championship runs have a, a, a tendency to go on too long and then you're not so keen to see that person hold the championship again. I'm not really a fan of Hot Potato, but I am a fan of the idea that a belt can change hands at any time. The idea that it can change after one defence or seven or ten defences, it doesn't really matter. Um, I like the idea of excitement that uh, anything can happen at any given time. So uh, with the X Division Championship, that's definitely moved around a bit too much for my liking, but it's always been traditionally been a championship that has swapped its hands uh, quite regularly throughout the history of Impact and TNA. Um, looking through on the other ones, as I say, tag team, not so much. Diana Prazo, she was quick to win the belt coming in, um, but when you look at it this year, I mean, uh, Jordan Grace was champion earlier in the year, so we've only had three champions throughout the year. We're what, now in October. I feel that that's sort of okay looking at things. So, uh, And with the World Championship, of course, Tessa won in January. She then went missing for a long time. Uh, Eddie Edwards, of course, was the makeshift champion. He was uh, the, the safe, steady pair of hands that they had. And now they've, they've quickly moved on to Eric Young, which I, I did think was quite soon. Um, but they're doing such great work with Eric Young. I find it hard to complain with what they've done with him. I, I said when he came in that Eric Young shouldn't win the belt straight away. He should have to work for it. But um, hell, they've made a believer out of me. They've done such great booking with him. So I can't really complain with what they've done there. But um, I would say when it comes to Bound for Glory, it's definitely too soon for Rich Swan. I don't don't want to see that belt change hands at that point. I would say that that would be a big error in Impact history if they were to do that. I'm not a problem with Swan becoming champion at some stage, but I want to see Swan work for it. I want to see Young have a, a, no, at least another three months as champion right now, and we could perhaps see someone of likes of Rich Swan could work towards it, maybe for, I don't know, the the future pay-per-views that we could get, maybe if there's Hard to Kill in January, maybe if there's one of these Impact specials we're going to get now, because it looks like we've got them starting monthly now, which is great as well. Uh, I believe Turning Point and, and No Surrender are coming in November and December, which is uh, really exciting to see, and uh, gives so much incentive as well to be a subscriber to Impact Plus for people that are not already. So, um, yeah, that's, that's definitely going to be something that's going to add some interest and intrigue going forward. Uh, but that's all from anyway this week anyway thank you for watching ask scw i've enjoyed the q a as always uh please go and check out other videos more will be coming in the week as well uh currently with the ww draft it seems to be the big thing that's going to be going on this week already have one video which is just under a thousand views now thank you to everyone that's checked it out uh but go and check out 10 superstars who must change shows uh during the ww draft uh, we'll be doing an official predictions for the ww draft as well that'll be dropping for you on i reckon tuesday i reckon i will drop that and i may do an extra video for the draft as well that may come up on Wednesday as well but so do keep an eye as well Raw Preview will be coming tomorrow as well but that's all from me, thank you for watching please like, share and subscribe share with a friend, I'll see you next time here on SCW, have a great day